Today we have a crazy story of revenge of getting revenge on an ex-boyfriend's entire family. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, ruin the Broadway dreams of a devious actor. While growing up, I'd always said to myself, if you're in denial of who you truly are, you can just try out acting. It didn't even have to be behind the screen or on stage, I was thinking about real life acting, like having multiple personalities. Don't judge me. I grew up in a big home with my parents, my aunties and uncles and all my siblings, and I was a very curious kid. So I picked up on behaviors a lot. It wasn't uncommon for me to mimic the way people in my home behaved, and when I say mimic, I meant more than just a phrase or sentence. I went as far as mimicking behaviors and reactions. Sometimes it was cute when I did it, but other times I was probably the most annoying kid you'd ever meet because I tended to mimic some behaviors they weren't proud of, although I was usually scolded when I did this. Not that it ever stopped me from doing it again. My father used to be an alcoholic as well, and I remember two or three occasions when I picked up a plastic bottle and mimicked his drunken demeanors and got in trouble with him. He wasn't a bad man, he just had a bad drinking habit and he wasn't abusive, just loud, and sometimes actually charming. And I think I picked up on that charming part of his drunkenness more than other behaviors because it made me feel that as long as I could charm people, then they could overlook my flaws. I never dreamed of acting or even going into the arts. If you asked me then what I wanted to do, I would have probably told you I wanted to be an astronaut or an archaeologist because I love dinosaurs and all that science stuff. But in the elementary school I attended, it was basically compulsory to be in some form of play as part of your extracurricular activities. It was one sport, one vocation, and one play. Although you could be in multiple if you wanted, but I didn't have time for all of that. I preferred to spend my free time in the library reading books about World War II, or the Encyclopedia Britannica like a proper nerd. My first ever play was in third grade when I acted as Santa Claus for A Christmas Carol but I had no lines and just had to dance throughout. At that point, rehearsals felt like just another math class, and so I had no emotional attachment to acting, if you could even call that acting. My second play was when I was in the fourth grade, and it was something similar, but this time, I had a few short lines halfway through the act. We were allowed to skip rehearsals, but the more you skipped, the less important your role was in the play. Although I didn't have an issue with this, because I wanted a less important role, and besides, Rehearsals were after school and clashed with my favorite cartoon, so I preferred to be home instead of singing with my classmates. The first time I would ever show interest in performing a play was after watching a popular kids musical movie. I was so intrigued that kids slightly older than I was at the time could do all of that acting. They almost reminded me of myself at home, and I began to realize that maybe this acting thing wouldn't be so bad. And so I decided to sign up for my first ever audition. I was in the 6th grade then, so I'd grown a bit and I could now perform in plays outside the mandatory ones. Basically, I could now choose the type of play I wanted to participate in, and I even joined the drama club so I could make friends who also wanted to try out acting. It started well for me because, even though I was rather shy, we had very encouraging teachers who allowed us to make mistakes and cheered us on whenever we got a single line perfectly. I felt it was a really good step for me because that was the first time I felt part of something outside my family. I got the part after my first ever audition, and it was probably a testament to how good I'd become at mimicking others. I made up for my shyness with brilliant portrayals of characters whenever I got into the zone, and the instructors ate this up because I didn't behave like the average kid who possessed my rare skill set. Maybe I wasn't a diva because of my shyness, but we'll never know. Although I was always quite humble if I do say so myself. After getting my first role, I continued to audition for more roles and it began to look like acting had taken the place of science and history in my interests. I'd found somewhere I could be anyone I wanted to be during a time in my life where I almost loved to be anyone but myself. So it was a match made in heaven. The more plays I featured in, the better I got and after a few grades, I would fully switch to the arts so I could create a possible path for myself in either theater or anything behind the screens. It was sad seeing my love for the sciences deplete, but at the end of the day, the things I learned about in the science never really concerned my academic work. So it didn't affect me too much, especially with how much I now loved going to school just for the next play. As the years went by, I got good enough at acting that I was now being carried along for external plays when I was in high school. 
My school was one of the top schools when it came to arts, so they had the facilities and partnerships I needed to take my acting to the next level, and I used the opportunity pretty well because I was able to make contacts and take on roles in productions outside the high school. All this time, I kept my interest in acting low-key for my family because they felt I was going to become an engineer or something similar, but I would eventually disappoint them with the revelation when I told them I wanted to pursue theater arts in the university. My father was obviously unhappy with this because all my life I had made him feel that I had a path in science. And because of this, he told me that I either change my choice back to something he could see a future for me in, or he would not fund my university education. At this point, I already felt like a professional actor and thought my father just didn't understand how far I'd gone. So I felt if I was able to show him what I could achieve in a few years, I could get him back on board. To fund my tuition for theater arts, I had to work two jobs a day as well as going for acting classes and actually participating in various plays. And it wasn't easy. In fact, it was the most tasking period of my life. But I had to keep pushing because giving up would have meant my parents were right. And then I would have to swallow the pill I was avoiding more than anything. I finally got into university and once I stepped into the theater arts department, I realized that all I'd experienced in theater before was child's play. I was quite young and most of the plays I'd partaken in was filled with people around my age, but now I was seeing people almost twice my age littered across the halls and theaters. I must admit, I was quite intimidated for a bit because while I'd overcome shyness around my peers when performing and auditioning, I hadn't quite hacked people in their 30s yet, and maybe foolishly didn't expect to interact with anyone in that bracket from my department, but I was wrong. Apparently, a lot of them stayed behind even after graduation so they could get acting gigs or continue to improve their craft in something of a refresher exercise. I was at the point of no return, so there was no way I was going to turn back then. So I decided I was going to overcome my fears and become one of the best actors in the department. I made a few friends relatively quickly, although they were my peers, so it was quite easy for us to bond. But then I realized there was something of a hierarchy within the department and the senior students usually tried their best to use their experience to their advantage over us younger people. In class, all was okay and even though I had some senior students in my class, they never tried to claim any authority and they actually acted like proper classmates. But whenever it came to auditions, it would always get political for some reason. The politics whenever it came to auditions was so glaring because the panel was usually made up of the lecturers from the department who favored the senior students due to their experience regardless of if the younger student was better for the role. They even let the senior students pick a few younger students who could join in the plays as something of a wild card. It was crazy to me because I was out there busting my butt with two jobs so I can prove a point to my dad that choosing a path in acting was the best for me, but here I was getting my opportunities robbed by a few lecturers because I was new in the university. Getting one of the senior students to vouch for you was another issue on its own because they had their favorites, and if it wasn't you, then you would have to find other means to convince them to pick you whether it be monetary or otherwise, but due to the principles I set for myself, I thought I was too good of an actor to have to pay to get my chance. There was one of the senior students who was an actual actor, and also the closest to the lecturers, and also known to act as a judge or sway their decisions. So everyone liked him, or at least they pretended to like him, even though he was usually very biased and picked people based on how close they were, or sometimes if they could convince him with a good offer, whatever that might mean to him at the time. Personally, I didn't dig this style of selection, but my only choice was to work hard enough that I couldn't be ignored. And boy, I could not be ignored because I put in great performances every time I stepped onto the stage. And my confidence grew each time because I knew I was getting closer to proving to my dad how much I could achieve as an actor. My chance to prove how good I'd become at acting to my parents would finally come when my university registered the theater arts department to participate in a national play where many of the big players in the film industry would be present. I was determined to make it to that stage, but first I had to pass my auditions, and I'd worked harder on a script than I'd ever done previously. I even had to take the entire week leading up to the audition off from work so I could properly get into the zone 
and get into the zone I did. On the audition day, I would totally kill it and even got a standing ovation from the audience, which made me feel so certain of making it to the big stage for the National Play Act. And I even informed my dad about it and told him how he was going to come and watch me perform in the National Theater because I was that sure. However, all my dreams would be shattered when the list of people who got the parts was released. I had auditioned for a single role because I had interest in only that role and even changed part of my personality to that of the character in the script for weeks before the audition to fully get into character. So imagine my shock when I found out that I was to go as an understudy to the main guy picked for the role I auditioned for. I didn't know what to say or do because I'd been telling everyone in my family how great I'd been during the audition and assuring them that I could get them stage front seats so they were really looking forward to it and imagine the shock and in some cases disgust on their faces when I told them I was only going to be an understudy. I was obviously disappointed with what had happened and I was also in denial. So I wanted to find out why I wasn't picked and approached a few students, both fresh and old, and I finally realized what had happened. The guy who got the part ahead of me had given some form of bribe to the senior student who was supposed to recommend us to the lecturers for a place on stage. It only got worse for me when my dad's health began to deteriorate due to all the stress he got from thinking he had failed with me. I wanted to give him a chance to be proud, and it was robbed from me by someone who decided graduation wasn't their ultimate calling in school, and there was for sure no way I was going to take the loss lying down, so I had to plot my revenge. Despite all he put me through, I never had an altercation with the actor-student. In fact, I never approached him directly after what he did to me after the auditions. And this played into my hands because he was totally unexpectant of my plans for him. I began to get closer to him, and since he sensed no malice, he was cool with that and allowed me into his space. From there, I began to operate and get more information. That was how I came to know about the Broadway international auditions that were coming to my university. He never told me these things directly, but I was always listening in on his conversations and found out that there was a plan for the students who had stuck around the department for the longest to represent the university on Broadway, including himself. With the way he spoke, I just knew he was hoping for it to be his big break, and apparently the chance to participate on Broadway only came every five years, so it was either then or probably never. I was licking my lips at all those revelations because now my plan was simple. Don't allow him to get to Broadway by any means possible. I didn't know how I was going to do this, but remembering what he had taken from me always gave me some extra motivation. So I decided to hang out with him more often to know what plan would be the best, and to my greatest relief, it turned out to be a relatively easy plan. After a few more weeks spent getting to know our actor student, I found out, not directly, that he was really lactose intolerant, like the worst kind. So I noted it down and waited for the right moment to use the information. The right moment here obviously was the audition to get to Broadway because of how much it meant to him. Broadway auditions were very different because we had all the judges come all the way from the USA and they didn't take the nonsense or act as nepotistic as the judges in our university did. They just gave you an honest remark and called it a day. And if you got a spot, you're sure you worked hard enough to deserve it. And our actor-student friend would work harder than I had ever seen him do. He also revealed to me that he saw Broadway as his best bet of transitioning from an actor-student to a full-blown actor at the top level. After denying me an opportunity to showcase my talents on stage at the National, he was here telling me how he was going to ditch us for Broadway. No way in heck! The day of the Broadway auditions came, and you could almost slice the tension in the air with a knife. But I was calm since only those who had finished their initial five-year theater art course were qualified, meaning just the senior students who had probably stuck around because the university was probably the only institution that could offer them such a chance. I baked donuts for everyone performing, because I was the nicest person ever. But I'd also put quite a lot of milk in the mix due to a certain lactose intolerant someone. While I was serving the donuts, he asked me if they contained any milk. But I denied, and because we'd built up a relatively close relationship, he agreed to have my delicious, mind-numbingly good donuts just 15 minutes before his audition. 
Five minutes before he was called up to the stage, he began to feel his tummy, and that was my cue to exit the scene of my crime. I went out to sit with the crowd and watched what unfolded, and to me, what eventually happened was the most entertaining performance of the night. As our actor student friend came out, he was already very sweaty and clutched his tummy every five seconds. He could barely even stand when he began to read his lines, and he tried to fight it until he could fight it no more. He totally made a mess of himself on stage like he took a laxative. I knew he said he had bad lactose intolerant, but I never knew it was that bad. He messed up the whole stage in front of judges from Broadway. There was definitely no way that they were going to pick him, and he had to be stretchered off the stage because it got really bad, and he didn't want to leave the stage for any reason. He lost what was probably his final chance at Broadway, and it was because of me. And I didn't even deny it when he approached me to ask if my donuts were the cause of his misfortune. I made it clear to him that he was going to be as miserable as he made me feel, and from that moment on, he would begin to respect the newer students. All I'm saying is, is if there was ever a subsection of people where you don't let friends or foe know anything about your potential weaknesses, I think it would be in the theater scene. Understandably, the dramatics can be quite dramatic. That said, our next story is, got back at my ex-boyfriend by getting revenge on his entire family. I was five when my mom left our home country for a new one. I'm not proud to say this, but we came in via an illegal method. For a long time, my mom and I remained undocumented and lived like fugitives in the country we moved to. My mom's brother had to get his wife to adopt me to ensure that I became a full citizen and have the great life that my mom envisioned for me. Things got better. I went to school, did very well in class, and was a star student. I was not popular and I didn't have nice clothes or anything, but I had my brains and that took me as far as I needed to go in school. Sadly, I didn't get a college scholarship in my senior year, so I had to pay my college tuition. My mom didn't make a lot of money working as a caregiver in an old people's home. She could barely even feed us, so there was no way she'd pay for my college tuition. My uncle's wife, my fake mother, had long divorced my uncle, so she was certainly not going to pay. We had a great relationship and still do, but she'd done more than enough for me by just adopting me. I couldn't ask for more. I decided to get a job and save enough money for college. I got a job at the airport. It paid enough for me to take care of myself and keep some money aside. Also, my mother still took care of most of the bills, and I was living with her until I could stand on my feet. We were doing just fine when my mom started to have issues with the guys she worked with. One of the women at the home was bullying my mom and being very mean to her, making racist comments and all. It went on for a while and it went unchecked until one day, my mom yelled at her and told her to saw it off. That pissed off the older woman and her family. The home management wanted my mother to apologize to the family since they were an influential family, but my mom refused. They were mad about it, but they couldn't sack her. As time passed, her boss's irritation with her grew. They argued a lot and had too many issues. The boss was annoyed that my mom, despite being an immigrant, was that audacious. One day, she called the immigration office and reported my mother. Well, we're not sure she did it, but we suspect that she did. My mom and I searched everywhere for an immigration lawyer we could afford, but we found none. Their fees were just too heavy for us. Eventually, we found a lawyer who was willing to help my mother and stop her deportation. On the day of her first hearing, I met my ex-husband. He was a tall, ugly-looking man, but he had the whitest set of teeth and he carried himself beautifully. He introduced himself to me and asked what I was doing there. Don't tell me this country's trying to kick you out, he said jocularly. I smiled nervously and said, no, just my mother. He told me why he was in court. One of his staff was going to get kicked out and he was trying to help her. She worked for my family for years. Now they want to separate her from her two kids. That's unfair. Was she a domestic worker? He said, oh yes, she helped my mom with the cleaning. I said, how sweet of you to want to help. He shook his head and laughed. Was that deliberate? I said, what? He said, help the help. I said, oh, no, it wasn't. It just came. I wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't pointed it out. He said, okay, beautiful lady. I have to go. It was nice making your acquaintance. I managed to offer him a smile and watched him leave. I didn't know his name the first time, but our conversation stuck. And I remember thinking he was a wonderful person. It is so ironic how the one thing I liked about my ex-husband when I first met him 
became the very thing that I hated about him eventually. The second time I saw my ex-husband, it was at the airport where I worked. He waved at me and smiled, revealing his beautiful white dentition. Hello, beautiful lady. Hello, I said. I was tired after a long day. He said, you work here? I said, yes, yes. He said, wow. Wow, what? It's just that I came here often and I've never seen you here. I said, oh, it's fine if you haven't. I'm not that noticeable. He said, I'd remember if I saw someone as beautiful as you are. Ordinarily, I'd have smiled at his cheesy comment, but I couldn't bring myself to. I was too tired and worried about too many things. He noticed my unsmiling face and asked what was wrong. He said, did your mom get off the hook? I said, nah. He said, what is your lawyer saying? He said she has no ties to this country and there's nothing to convince the judge about. He said, nonsense, of course she has ties with someone, she has you. I sighed. I didn't know if I could tell him that on paper, my mother was not my mother. I knew I shouldn't, but I told him anyway. He stared into space for what seemed like an eternity and made me regret oversharing. Then he turned to me, pulled a card out of his pocket, and asked me to call him. I called him the next morning, but before I did that, I borrowed my friend's computer and looked him up. I was shocked at the result. He was from a very powerful family in the country. His grandparents were immigrants and his dad is doing very well. I saw pictures of his family, his mom, and his sisters. He was a lawyer and so were his younger sisters. Their dad was a businessman and his mom was a lawyer. I could not believe that someone as educated and rich as he was would be interested in me. Maybe he just wanted to help you, do something for someone. He did help his mother's maid, my mother explained when I told her about my confusion. He was flirting with me, ma. She said, maybe he likes you. Why is that so hard to believe? I said, he looks like he's in his 20s. He's older, rich, influential. What could interest him in someone like me? Since you find my point about him liking you so unbelievable, maybe he just wants to help. Maybe he's just a good person. My mom was wrong. My ex-husband was far from being a good person and so were the members of his family. He asked me to come and see him in his office and I did. I went in during lunch break hours and he called an old buddy of his who immediately accepted my mother's case. After two months of court back and forth, my mom was allowed to apply for a proper residency permit. At that time, my ex and I had already started going out. He'd take me to the fanciest restaurants and buy me nice gifts like clothes, lip gloss, and flowers. He was very sweet to me, but now that I look back, I notice how impersonal he was. I just always felt like he was hiding something, like something was off about him, but I never listened. He had been kind to my mom and he was kind to his help. That was all that mattered to me at the time. After seven months of being together, my mom slumped suddenly while working and died. I had no one in the world, nobody but him. He asked me to marry him and I agreed. It was shortly after I'd agreed that it occurred to me that I didn't know a lot about him. Sure, I know who his family was and what huge case he was working on, but I never quite knew him deeply. Had he always wanted to be a lawyer? Did he enjoy what he did? What was his previous relationship like? I could never really answer these questions about him. It wasn't until I'd married him that I understood why. My family is a very traditional one, he told me one day. I said, what do you mean? He said, daddy wanted us all to stay in the house, especially since I'm a man. You live with your parents? I wondered to myself how I never even knew that. He said, yeah, I found that many women are not comfortable with that. I hope you will be though. I know you grew up here, but surely your mom taught you some things about our culture. I nodded slowly. My ex had a way of talking to me like I was a child. He just said things with a note of finality, like he wasn't seeking my opinion at all. I put up with it and with him because I felt indebted to him for helping out with my mom. He also promised to pay my college tuition after we got married, so I did not resist him out of gratitude. I found out eventually that my ex-husband deliberately picked me. He wanted someone who already felt small so he could control them. I got married to my ex and to this day, it remains the biggest mistake I have ever made. My marriage to my ex was an extremely bizarre one. We lived in his parents' mansion with his parents, their domestic workers, and his youngest sister. His immediate younger sister was a rebel. She refused to live with them, refused to practice as a lawyer, and was hardly ever at family functions. When I first met her, she welcomed me warmly into the family, but when she was alone with me, she reached out, held my right hand, and said, leave him. I'm sorry, what did you say? She looked at me unsure, then she sighed and repeated herself. You are young. You're going to regret this. 
I shook my head and snatched my hand from hers. What's the deal with your sister? I asked my ex later that day. He said, ignore her. She's crazy. I wish I didn't listen to my ex. I already suspected even before my ex and I got married that there'd be trouble. But my fear was confirmed when I told him that I was going to start preparing my college application and he ignored me. He just didn't offer any response, not even a word. Did you hear me? I asked again. He ignored me and walked away from our bedroom. The next time I asked him, he still ignored me. I was furious, but I controlled my anger and tapped him. He turned around and slapped me. It happened so fast I couldn't believe it. For days I was in denial about what had happened. I kept telling myself that my ex did not slap me. I probably imagined it, but it happened. After he hit me, he went on a work trip, leaving me by myself to deal with what he'd done. One morning, his mother and I were having breakfast, the others left for work, and I blurted out that her son had hit me. She paused, wiped her mouth and said, eat your food, dear. That afternoon, she knocked and without waiting for a response from me, she walked into our bedroom. It still feels strange to call that room our bedroom, it was just never mine. She said sometimes her son gets stressed, and whenever he's stressed, he does things that aren't so pleasant. Don't provoke him, she admonished and walked out. The next morning, my ex sent me a bouquet through one of the staff to apologize for his behavior. I forgave him, and many times after that, I forgave him still. I became a joke to the entire family. My ex would yell at me in the presence of his family and staff. Nobody there respected me, not his family, nor the staff. The only person who saw me as a human was his immediate younger sister, but she was hardly ever around. I noticed, though, that whenever she was around, my ex never disrespected me. In fact, everyone sort of behaved themselves whenever she was in the mansion. It was because of this that when I became lonely and badly needed someone to talk to, I spoke to her. She invited me to her home and I went there discreetly. Upon entering her home, I realized why my ex had called her crazy. My ex-sister-in-law lived in a very quiet part of town. The only sound one heard around there were the sounds of birds chirping away. It was a serene environment and one could tell that the setting was deliberate. It's so quiet here. I commented on the serenity of her surroundings. She said, yeah, it was deliberate. I was trying to get away from the noise and chaos of living in the mansion. It's not that bad, I said to my sister-in-law. Isn't it? She smiled and sipped whatever liquid she was drinking from her mug. Has he hit you yet? She asked me, staring at my face as if she'd find cues. I was shocked. I know none of my parents-in-laws told her that. They had a horrible relationship and barely spoke to each other anyway. She saw the surprise on my face. There's a lot you don't know. That day, I parted ways with my sister-in-law, determined to get a divorce from my ex. I was insane. I'd lost myself and could not even remember the last time I smiled. I had my revenge planned out on my way home. I was so distracted that I almost hit another car on the drive back to the mansion. A month after my meeting with my ex's sister, I had gathered one ammunition to nail the whole family with. My ex's sister was a recovering alcoholic. I just had to get her to drink and then record her saying whatever she was going to say. I went to her home with two bottles of wine, hoping that she wouldn't turn them down, but she didn't. She started drinking almost immediately. She told me so many things, things that shocked me. She told me about my ex and the woman he dated before me. They were together for six years and in all those years, he brutally abused her. She told me about her dad and how he used to hit her mom. Her dad had SA'd two of their domestic staff. One was stubborn and tried to report it, but they had her deported. The other stayed with them anyway and they rewarded her loyalty by letting their son represent her in court and get her residential permit. She spilled so many things that were just too horrific and thankfully, I recorded it all. She passed out just as I was about to leave and I felt so bad about it that I had to stay the night. His father is a known businessman who depends heavily on favors from his political friends to make money, so his reputation was important. I didn't have enough dirt on my ex, so I was going to sacrifice his family. I also knew that I had to be discreet. The family has spies and people who just wanted to do them a favor and get something in return, so I had to be very careful. I had to check, go out there and search for papers or any publication that put the family in a bad light. I eventually found one a reporter who claims his dad was done dirty by their family. 
I reached out to him via his email and asked what he'd do if someone in the family has confidential incriminating information about them. I've met too many people who claim to have information about them. They all had no evidence and were not willing to put their names on it. Anything I publish will be regarded as malicious. I decided to risk it all and met up with him. He was a fine young man and we soon became lovers, united by our hatred for my ex's family. He spoke to his bosses and they decided to make a documentary about the family. My name and face were going to be out there, but I didn't mind. I needed the money and action from the public. The documentary was produced. While it was undergoing production, I was getting slapped at home by my ex. One day, my ex-father-in-law found out about the documentary and he found out that I was in it. He threatened to have me deported. I was already a citizen, so I laughed in his face. That only showed me how right his daughter and everyone else was about him. He got so mad that he nearly hit me. His staff had to hold him back. They kept trying to get me to take back my permission for the documentary, but I refused. I moved out and moved into my journalist lover's tiny apartment. It was small, but nobody was hitting me. My ex called and begged me to take back my permission, but I refused. Eventually, the family was able to bribe one of the top people on the project, and they halted production. My lover and I were pissed about it, but a very few months later, the documentary leaked and nearly everyone was watching. It hurt me only because I wasn't able to make money from it, but I was glad that I was able to get revenge on that family. They watched me get abused and did nothing. The company had to ask my ex's dad to step down as the CEO and their youngest daughter was asked to take a break from work too. His political friends started to deny him and stay away from him. At the end of it all, my ex and his family lost a lot of money, credibility, and goodwill from people. Although they lost all that money, credibility, and goodwill, I don't know if they truly got what they deserved. I mean, this is a family of abusers who are willing to take advantage of people who have nowhere else to go and then try to take even more and abuse them. They didn't deserve to have a little bit of credibility and a little bit of money lost. They deserve to be behind bars. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.